Chapter 8, Odd Number Problems 1-7. through seven. The value of the z-score in a hypothesis test is influenced by a variety of factors. Assuming that all other variables are held constant, explain how the value of z is influenced by each of the following. Let's first consider the equations that we are referring to. So standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. z is equal to sample mean minus population mean divided by standard error. So A says, an increase in the difference between the sample mean and the, po the original population mean. So what are the effects on Z? Well, again, with the researcher is hoping for a large mean difference. In other words, the sample that was exposed to treatment, um, we hope, is very different from the population um, average of those who have not received treatment. So if the mean difference, or the numerator of our Z equation, increases then we, shouldn't, we should expect uh, an effect on our z-score. So uh, to be more specific, a larger mean difference m minus mu that doesn't look very nice, so let's clear that up m minus mu will produce a larger z value. Again, mathematically, we, we know that if the numerator increases, then we should expect an increase in our um, quotient, the z value in this case. We also know that we're hoping for large z values, and large z values are going to be obtained by showing an effect on um, the sample mean, so producing a sample mean that is different um, than the population mean, the population that hasn't received treatment. So again, we're hoping for large mean difference, right? Large mean difference can produce a larger z value, larger z values, um, are out in the tail, which is our goal. So again, we want larger z values. Okay, next, an increase in population standard deviation. Again, mathematically, now we're looking at the standard error of the mean equation. Um, and we should recognize that as, oops, excuse me, an increase in the population standard deviation will increase the standard error which will produce produce a smaller z-score. So mathematically speaking, if we're considering our standard error equation, which is the standard deviation divided by the square root, again, if our um, numerator increases, if our numerator increases and everything else still stays constant, um, we will have a larger quotient, in this case, the standard error. And if we have a larger standard error um, in our z equation, if we're dividing by a larger number, the denominator increases, then our z score is going to decrease. And again, that should conceptually make sense. Again, so we're talking about the greater likelihood of our z value falling in the center when we have greater variability in the population standard deviation. So mathematically that should make sense given the effects of um, increasing one of these values um, and the results on what we're solving for. But conceptually it should also make sense that when we have flatter, more diverse population um, distributions when we take samples from those distributions, we're going to produce a distribution sample means that is also more diverse and more spread out. Again, making it more difficult to find a z-score that's unique um, 
because we have such great variety. So we can think of standard deviation and standard error as illustrations of variability. As variability increases, um, the ability to show large mean difference um, is more difficult. In other words, these differences are obscured by the original variability and then the variability that's transferred into the distribution of sample means. Okay, and finally, an increase in the number of scores in the sample. So an increase in the sample size will decrease the standard error, which will increase the Z value of the Z score. So again, mathematically speaking, if we're, um, if we're considering our standard error equation over here, that if we um, increase our N, right, we increase N, we're dividing by a larger number, that's going to decrease our quotient, and then um, when we divide by that value, so we, we divide by a lower number, the standard de um, error has decreased, um, then our z-score is going to increase. And again, that's ideal. So we could think of this, I can write it this way, as n increases, standard error decreases, and z-score increases. And again, this is, um, from our perspective, a good thing because we want um, z-values to be large and further out in the tails, further from the center z-score of zero. Number three, although there is a popular belief that herbal remedies such as ginkgo, biloba, and ginseng may improve learning and memory in healthy adults, these effects are usually not supported by well-controlled research. In a typical study, a researcher obtains a sample of N equals 16 participants and has each person take the herbal supplements every day for 90 days. At the end of the 90 days, each person takes a standard memory test. For the general population, scores for the test form a normal distribution with a mean equal to 50 and a standard deviation of 12. The sample of research participants had an average of M equal to 54. Assuming a two-tailed test, state the null hypothesis in a sentence that includes the two variables being examined. So we, um, again, learned in this chapter what it means to identify or state a two-tailed hypothesis. Briefly, it indicates that we are being very broad and general in our hypothesis. We are not specifying the direction that we anticipate our results to reside. In other words, we're not saying that the remedy is going to increase memory nor decrease it. We just are going to state that it has an effect on memory. So before we state our hypothesis, let's identify the independent and the dependent variable. The dependent is the outcome. What are we measuring in the end? So we know that memory, right, an effect on memory, and what is going to affect memory? The herbal remedy. So the dependent variable is the memory. We expect some change in memory. And the independent variable is the herbal remedy. So if we state our research hypothesis, H sub 1, we would state that the independent variable, in this case the herbal, remedy has an effect on memory. And the null, the null hypothesis negates that and it says H sub zero indicates um, we would state the herbal remedy does not, does not have an effect on memory. This is a very basic structure of a two-tailed hypothesis where you simply um, state the independent variable, the independent variable, 
and indicate that in the null hypothesis and state that it has, um, excuse me, in the research hypothesis and indicate that it has an effect on the dependent variable, the memory. So once you identify the independent dependent variable, it's a simple replacement of phrases. So the independent variable has an effect on the dependent variable. Replace with specific information, the herbal remedy has an effect on memory. And again, this is just a very basic, broad, two-tailed hypothesis. We are not specifying the direction in which what we which we expect the sample mean to fall above the average or below increase or decrease in memory. We just expect it to have an effect. In terms of notation, I would like to add one more thing. That if we're saying that the in the hypothesis that the remedy will have an effect, we are essentially saying that um, the population of the treated group would not equal zero, excuse me, um, yeah, would not equal zero, right? We expect that it to be, excuse me, not zero, 50. Um, that the treated population mean would not equal 50. Please um, recognize that the sample that we're using to test this um, independent variable or the treatment um, is the representation of the treated population of what we would anticipate if everyone in the population received treatment. So this notation has indicated that the population of the treated, treated group would not equal 50 because 50 is the mean of the untreated population. The null would say that the treated population would equal 50, that we wouldn't expect a difference. Um, again, we use mu because inferential statistics is about using a sample to draw conclusions about population. So our conclusions would be that if everyone received treatment, uh, we, would, we would see a difference between those who did and those who did not. 3b, using the standard four-step procedure, conduct a two-tailed hypothesis test with alpha equal to 0.05 or 5% to evaluate the effect of the supplements. Step one is to identify the research and null hypothesis, which we just did in the previous example. So we'll begin with step two. Step two uh, requires that we set the parameters for our study. So again, we remember that we've been told to conduct a test at uh, alpha equal 5% or 0 0.05. It's a two-tailed two -tailed test. And uh, what we need to find out is our critical region um, Z value. So from what we've learned in the past, um, if we're utilizing a 5% alpha, what we're essentially saying is the 95% of most common scores will be in the center. And we have a difference of 5%. That means 2.5% in this tail and 2.5% in that tail. And essentially what we're looking for is um, a sample average that has less than a 2.5% chance of occurring, either above the mean or below the mean. So um, we need to figure out what z is equal to here. We've um, done this quite a bit um, in other examples. Again, this requires that we take that 2.5% um, and, and divide by 100 to produce a proportion, which is 0 0.0250. Zero. And then we enter the tail of the unit normal table and identify what our z-score would equal. And by doing so, we should see that z is equal to negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. So what we've done is establish the critical region in the tails. We're hoping that our sample mean resides in the tails. If it does, that means that the z-score is greater than 1.96. I'm going to clean this up just a, a, a tad so that I can fit in a couple more things here. Um, so, again, we just established our, z, our critical z is equal to negative 1.96 or positive 1.96. So our next step is to, so that was step two. Step three says calculate your statistics. 
So again, um, let's remember what we're working with. We have a sample equal to 16. We have a sample average equal to 54. A population average equal to 50. And a standard deviation of the population equal to 12. Again, what we are doing is um, trying to explain the difference between 54 and 50. Our two options are, one, the difference of four points is simply due to chance, also known as sampling error, or that the difference is due to the remedy, the herbal remedy that those individuals took. So again, that would indicate statistical significance. In order to draw our conclusions, we're going to need to calculate our z-score. Our z is equal to the sample mean minus the population mean divided by standard error. If we replace variables, we could say z is equal to 54 minus 50, and we need to calculate our standard error. So standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. Standard error is equal to 12 over the square root of 16. Standard error is equal to 12 over 4, which is equal to 3. Okay, so now we have our denominator. We have 54 minus 4 is equal to 4. Divide by 3, and we get 1.33. 1.33. So we've just concluded that our sample mean average of 54 is equivalent to 1.33 standard error units above the mean. So if we consider where a critical region cutoff point is, which is 1.96, and note that um, the mean z-score is here 0, our z-score, our sample mean z-score, falls between 0 and 1.96, and it is not in the critical region. So step four says we draw our conclusions based on our statistics. So our conclusion would be that we fail to reject the null. We conclude that the herbal remedy does not have an effect on memory. And we state our z value. z is equal to 1.33 and identify that we conducted um, a probability test or z test where the probability of obtaining a z score right of 1.35 is greater than alpha or you can think of it as a probability of obtaining that value is greater than 0.05% chance. Again, recognizing that 5% needs to be split in half amongst the two tails. Um, so we conclude that um, this z value is not um, in the critical region, and therefore we, d we do not have evidence to support our hypothesis. And as a result, we fail to reject the null for this example. I think I'm going to just add a little bit more and um, redraw this um, graph to hopefully make it a little um, clearer for everyone to see what, what exactly we're doing. Um, things can get quite messy when we've got a lot to display. So again, given the parameters of our research, we identify, again, the things that we know. We know the mean of the distribution the average memory score was 50. We know that that's the equivalent of a z-score of 0. Um, given that we're conducting a two-tailed hypothesis test um, and with alpha of 5%, our critical region is set at 1.96 positive and negative 1.96. And again, our sample mean z-score must be greater than 1.96, so it has to be 1.97, 1.98, um, either positive or negative, to be pushed out into the critical region. When we calculated our z-score, um, z we found that it was equal to 1.33. So again, our 
example mean was equal to 54. This is mu. And that was the equivalent of 1.33 positive uh, standard error units above the mean. So again, it's falling into this, what we would refer to as common area. And essentially, our conclusion, again, other than uh, stating that we fail to reject the null, basically we're saying that the difference between 54 and 50 is um, simply due to chance, and it's sampling error. And statistically speaking, we would say that 54 is equal to uh, 50 which is kind of an odd thing to think of. But statistically speaking, they are equal to one another because the chances of obtaining a sample average of 54 from the untreated population is so high that it doesn't make that value uh, distinctly different. Number five, a local college requires an English composition course for all freshmen. This year, they are evaluating a new online version of the course. A random sample of 16 freshmen is selected and the students are placed in the online course. At the end of the semester, all freshmen take the same English composition exam. The exam score for the sample is M equal to 76. For the general population of freshmen who took the traditional lecture class, the exam score is forming normal distribution with a mean equal to 80. If the final exam scores for the population have a standard deviation of 12, does the sample provide enough evidence to conclude that the new online course is significantly different from the traditional class. Assume a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 5%. So our um, hypothesis would state that the exam scores will be affected by the online method of teaching. The null would say that the exam scores will not be affected. So what we need to do is um, identify what the critical region would be for a two-tailed test at 5% alpha. And again, this is a very familiar critical Z that we'll be utilizing, and we did um, Z is equal to positive negative 1.96. Again, the method by which we found that was explained in the previous example. Next, we need to convert that sample mean into a Z-score. So Z is equal to m minus mu divided by standard error. Let's replace variables. Our sample mean is equal to 76. Our population mean is equal to 80. And our standard deviation needs to be calculated. Standard error, excuse me, our standard error is equal to standard deviation over the square root of n. Standard error is equal to 12 over the square root of 16. Standard error is equal to 12 over 4, um, which gives us 3. So we come back over here and calculate our z value. Our z value in this case, 76 minus 80 divided by 3, and our calculators produces negative 1.33. All right, so let's sketch out our distribution and place all these values so that we can draw our conclusions. So we have our normal distribution. The average exam score is equal to 80. We know that that's the equivalent of a z-score of 0. We have a sample mean of 76. 76, which we just calculated is equivalent to a z-score of 1.33. And given that we were tasked with conducting a two-tailed hypothesis with alpha equal to 5%, we establish our critical z values at negative 1.96, positive 1.96. And again, we're not defining the proportion of something, but I am going to show you this area because this is the area in which we hope our sample mean will reside. Here, again, our task is to determine if the difference between 76 and 80 is statistically significant, meaning that the treatment produce uh, a sample average very different from the untreated population average of 80. Because of um, the z-score, right, the equivalent z-score for a sample mean of 76 is 1.33, it's not far enough away from the population mean of 80, does not reside in the critical region, and therefore we would um, conclude that we would have to fail to reject the null and conclude that the um, course, the online course, course, 
colors. Does not produce different exam scores. And our z was equal to, we drew our conclusions based on our statistics, z was equal to negative 1.33, and our probability statement would be as follows. The probability of obtaining a z-score of negative 1.3 is greater than our alpha 0 0.05 greater than our alpha 0 0.05. 5b, if the population standard deviation is 6, is the sample sufficient to demonstrate a significant difference? Again, assume two tail tests at alpha equal to 5. So using the same statistics, we're now just going to um, test this um, hypothesis using a lesser population variability and see if that has an effect on our conclusions. So again, um, restating our values, we have a population mean equal to 80, a sample average equal to 76. Now our population standard deviation is 6 opposed to 12, and our sample size is still equal to 16. All right, so um, again, the null would say that the um, exam scores are not affected by the online presentation of the course, and the research um, hypothesis would say that the exam scores are affected by the online presentation of the course. So we're going to calculate our z-score. Z is equal to m minus mu divided by standard error. Replace variables, z is equal to 76 minus, 50, excuse me, minus 80 over our standard error. Let's calculate standard error. Standard error is the standard deviation over square root of n. Standard error is equal to 6 divided by the square root of 16. So our standard error is equal to 6 over 4, which is equal to 1.5. So again, we see a change in the stand The standard deviation decreased and thereby decreased the standard error of the distribution of sample means. So now we're dividing by a smaller number right, um, than we were in the previous example. So 76 minus 80 divide by 1.5 and our calculators should yield negative 2.67. So now let's draw this out so that we can draw our conclusions, make sense of what we're doing. So we have our distribution our mean is equal to 80. We still have a score of 76. Um, we're going to recognize that 80 is equal to a z-score of 0. Our z-score, critical region z-scores are 1.96 and negative and positive 1.96. And now we have a z-score of negative 2.6 and that would fall into the tail so it would be out here 2.67 2.67 and because it is in the critical region right showing that that z-score has a lower probability um, than the alpha of 5% we would get to reject reject the null and our z is equal to 2, negative 2.67, and our probability statement would be the probability of obtaining that value is less than 0 0.05. And we're happy. We're always hoping for this kind of notation where the probability of our z value is less than our alpha. Um, so let's talk about in 5C um, the effects. As we saw in problem one, verbally we talked about um, and conceptually the effects of changing one variable, increasing one variable on the z-score. And here are, is an example illustrating that, seeing the math um, come alive and understand that as we went from a standard deviation of 12 to 6, right, um, we had lower variability that had an effect on our conclusions because our z-score now was much higher. 
Um, just a point of clarification, don't confuse the negative right, um, with the value of the score. The negative value is, again, if this is zero here, the z value, right, um, the, the numeric value decreases as we approach zero. Um, in terms of the negative, you know, that's a, that's a different value that we're placing on it. The negative is just telling us what side of the mean we're on. So again, we want large z values, um, regardless of it's negative or positive when it's a two-tailed hypothesis test. So again, lower variability, Um, in the population decreased the variability in the distribution of sample means, which is denoted by the standard error. Again, variability of the distribution of sample means is standard error. And so the lower variability in the population decreased the variability in the distribution of sample means and increased the z value, which enabled us to reject, reject the null hypothesis in this case. Again, um, one should recognize that we have no ability of changing the variability of the original population um, distribution, but here mathematically we're just showing that if we have a distribution, population distribution that has lesser variability or less, excuse me, less variability, then we will produce a distribution sample means that will also have less variability less variability will make the mean difference more evident. Greater variability obscures those differences. So this is just an example to help us um, better understand number one, where we discuss the um, equations and conceptually the effects of variability changing, and sample size changing um, on the z value. Number seven, a random sample of n equals 25 scores is selected from a population with a mean of 40. After a treatment is administered to the individuals in the sample, the sample mean is found to be m equal 44. If the population standard deviation is equal to 5, is the sample mean sufficient to conclude that the treatment has an effect? Use a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 5%. So what we need to do is convert our sample mean into a z-score. And um, z is equal to m minus mu divided by standard error. We replace variables. z is equal to um, m minus, excuse me, I actually have numbers here, 44 minus 40 divided by our standard error. Let's calculate standard error. Standard error is equal to our standard deviation over the square root of n. We have um, standard deviation equal to five. Actually, this um, should be 15. Let me make a correction. My mistake, it is five. Um, and the next one, it's 15. So it is equal to five um, over the square root of 25. So we have five divided by five, and we get one. So our z-score is equal to 44 minus 40 divided by 1, and we get a very large z-score equal to 4. So let's draw this out and identify our critical region um, z-scores. So again, we have our distribution where the mean of the untreated population is equal to 40. It's equal to 40. And our critical region is set at z-scores of negative and positive 1.96. Again, very common z-scores will never change um, for two-tailed tests with alpha 
um, 0 0.05, so positive 1.96. And we're hoping for a uh, sample mean z-score to fall into one of the two tails, which would uh, denote statistical significance. We find that our sample mean of 44 is way over here in the equivalent of a z-score equal to 4. I should write my z values um, down below here. So let me not write my um, sample means and means in the same place so that it makes a little bit more sense. So let me rewrite this. So we have our z values of 0, negative 1.96, positive 1.96. Again, these are sample mean. So then our sample mean was 44, and that was the equivalent of a z-score of 4. To be um, more precise, we would recognize that it's way actually, um, oh, not, not over here. Boy, I really messed things up. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? 44 is larger than 40, so we're talking about a score way over here, way over here. And that um, is the equivalent of a z-score equal to 4. z-score, so these are my z-values. These would be my sample mean values. So again, we were tasked with uh, determining if the difference between 40 and 44 was due to chance, or if it was due to... Um, the treatment statistical significance and because of the z value and where it resides that the fact that it's well into the critical region we would get to reject our null hypothesis and again in this case we don't have specifics about the independent dependent variable we just recognize that the null says that there's no effect and we're going to reject that idea because our z value is so um, significant, um, it's so large that we conclude that that sample mean is representative of the mean of the entire treated population, entirely different population, different than the untreated. So we reject the null and our z value is equal to 4. Our probability statement would say that the probability of obtaining a z-score equal to 4 is less than alpha at 5%. I'm going to do one more calculation um, for this just to give us uh, exposure to Cohen's D. There are not a lot of examples that ask us to calculate Cohen's D. And Cohen's D um, is calculated by taking your mean difference and divided by the population standard deviation. And so what we're calculating, Cohen's D represents the mean difference expressed in standard deviation units. Not standard error units, standard deviation units and it gives us a better representation of the mean difference based on the original units of um, average difference or distance and the original population. So we use this as a way of supporting our conclusions because we know mathematically we can increase sample size and as a result increase our z-values. So it's a way of, of providing a supporting statistic to ensure that we're not committing any errors. Um, so in other words, if you have large z values but very low Cohen's d values, then most likely you're committing um, a, a type 1 error where you're rejecting the null when you actually should fail to reject. So let's do our calculations. We replace our variables. We have 44 minus 40 divide by 5 and we get a Cohen's d equal to 0.8 and from our reading we were um, given a table, table 8.2 from the text that gave us a sense of the magnitude of Cohen's d. So 0.8 is considered very significant. Um, what we're understanding is that from um, here to here is 0.8 standard deviation units. So one standard deviation of the population is equal to five points. Um, and so that would make sense. This is four point difference, just shy of five point difference. 
And so it's a fraction of, it's a little less than one standard deviation unit. So it helps us better understand how far away this um, sample mean is from the population mean, considering the original population distribution. So um, coincidence is equal to 0.8, and we would use that as a supporting statistic um, in our conclusions. So we would actually write z is equal to 4. Our probability, um, before we write our probability, we would say that Cohen's d, d is equal to 0.8, and our probability of obtaining that z-score is less than alpha. Okay, we're using the same distribution for the population, but now the um, population innervation has increased to 15. So let's see what the effects would be on our conclusions. Again, we're going to convert our z, um, our sample mean into a z-score. So z is equal to m minus mu over standard error. z is equal to 44 minus 40 divided by standard deviation. Excuse me, standard error. Standard error is standard deviation over square root of n. Standard error is equal to now 15. So we've increased it from 5 to 15. And the sample size still remains 25. So we have 15 divided by 5, and we get 3. So now notice we're dividing by a larger number. In the previous example, we divided by 1. Now we're dividing by 3, and we get an answer. Let's see here. 44 minus 40 divided by 3 produces a z-score of 1.33. Again, still using a two-tailed test with alpha equal to 5. So we would draw our distribution. The mean is equal to 40. That's the equivalent z-score of 0. Our critical region is defined by a z-score of negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. Again, we're hoping it falls in this region or this region, having low probability. But instead, we see that it falls here, somewhere in here in 44, right? The mean of 44. I don't know why I keep doing that. <laughs> I am so sorry. At least I catch it, though. You're probably screaming at the screen as this is uh, trans <laughs> transpiring in front of you. Put it on the right side. <laughs> Sorry about that. So we have a mean of 44. I just want everything to be negative today for some reason. And that's the equivalent of a z-score of 1.33. And again, that's not large enough to put us out in the critical region. I'm just going to rewrite all of this over here. So we can see that a little bit more clearly. So we had a z-score here of positive 1.96 and our z of 1.33 for a sample mean of 44. So again, our um, task was to determine if the difference between 44 and 40 was statistically significant, meaning that the difference is due to treatment. In this case, we would conclude that it's not significant, that 40 is no different, excuse me, 44 is no different than 40, statistically speaking, and that they would be considered as equal to one another. And we would uh, fail to reject the null. And as we did with the last one, let's calculate Cohen's d just uh, to provide a supporting statistic. So D, Cohen's D is equal to the mean difference, sample mean minus population mean over standard deviation population. D is equal to 44 minus 40. Divide by 5, excuse me, not 5, 15. 15, and that's equal. So take 44, subtract 40, and divide it by 15, and we should get 0.27, which is a very low Cohen's D. In fact, if we refer back to table 8.2, where we see the magnitude of D um, illustrated as either small, medium, or large, 0.2 is considered small, 0.5 is medium, and 0.8 is large. So we would conclude that this is a small, has a small effect, and it's low enough where we would support this conclusion of fail to reject the null. Our z is equal to positive 1.33. Our d is equal to, it's a supporting statistic of 
and our probability statement would say that P is greater than 0 0.05. Greater than, again, what we're saying is the probability of obtaining this Z value, right, the probability of a Z value um, equal to 1.33, right, is greater than a 5% chance. Okay, so there's um, greater than a 5% chance that we would obtain a z-score of 1.33. And that's too large. Again, we're looking for something that has less than a 2.5% chance of occurring because we have to take that 5% and split it into two tails. Alright, so C says, um, comparing your answers for parts A and B, explain how the magnitude of the standard deviation the magnitude of the standard deviation influences the outcome of the hypothesis. So we saw that as the standard deviation of the population increased, right, um, our standard error also increased and our Z value decreased. So as standard deviation population increased, the variability of the original population increased. That produced greater variability in the distribution of sample means and consequently decreased our z value. A smaller z value is going to be closer to the center of the distribution and therefore making it more difficult, if not impossible, to reject the null hypothesis because our z value will not um, likely fall into the critical region when it's a smaller. So the likelihood of rejecting the null is less. So Larger, we can write this out a little bit um, more explicitly, larger standard deviation increased standard error, which decreased Z statistic. And we understand that low z-scores have a higher probability, higher probability that make it that make make them less likely to fall in the critical region. Right, because I'm getting, let's draw here. The mean, the z value of the mean is in the center. So smaller z scores are going to reside close to that value. We're hoping to be in the tails, right? In the tails, which require higher z scores.